Um, hello, and uh, I assume we are now live with everyone. Um, I can't see everyone, but uh, welcome. I am Stuart Elgy. I'm wearing three hats today. Um, I'm the chair of the Smart Prosperity Institute, a law professor at University of Ottawa, and I was counsel for Canada's Eco-Fiscal Commission in this case. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on the constitutionality of the federal carbon price last week. Our panel today will talk about what that means for the future of climate policy in Canada. We've got four great panelists who Mia Robson will introduce shortly. Um, I should add that this, today's webinar is co-hosted by Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, and the Smart Prosperity Institute. I'm joining you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Um, we meet virtually today, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands we are on today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of indigenous peoples and their cultures. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and consider how we can try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Okay. Now, before we dive into the politics, some quick background on the statute and the case. Um, the issue in this case was whether or not the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act fell within federal constitutional powers. Alberta, Ontario, and Saskatchewan brought cases arguing it did not. Um, the act in this case puts a price on carbon emissions, uh, currently $30 a ton and rising by $10 a ton each year. And the act has two parts. Part one of it puts a direct price on all fossil fuels and part two applies just to industry emitters. Uh, they pay a carbon price on all emissions above a certain performance threshold based on about the 80th or 90th best performing firms in their sector. A central part of the act is its backstop. The federal law does not apply in any province that has its own carbon pricing system in place. Um, and uh, a number of provinces and territories have laws that fully or partially meet this equivalency test but a number do not. And we'll hear about that, I'm sure, in the panel. Um, finally, all revenues from the carbon price by law must be returned to their province of origin. Uh, it's done currently mainly through a lump sum rebate to all taxpayers in those provinces. The decision in brief was that the court found the law to be constitutional in a 6-3 ruling. It found that the federal government has the power to set national minimum standards for pricing greenhouse gas emissions. And there's two things to note there. One is that the federal power is to set national minimum standards, not to take over regulation of the area, much the same approach as we use in healthcare. And secondly, the court's decision was limited to pricing. Uh, federal laws dealing with other aspects of greenhouse gas reduction will have to be authorized under other parts of the Constitution, such as the criminal law power. So with that basic background, um, let me turn it over now to our moderator for today's discussion, Mia Robson, Energy and Environment Reporter for the Canadian Press. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. So I think anyone who has paid any attention, even a little bit to climate policy and politics in Canada was waiting with bated breath for that decision last week, even if regardless of which decision, uh, which side of the decision you sit on. For me, who has simultaneously been covering uh, COVID as well as uh, environment and energy, I like to say, you know, I like to cover all global crises at the same time. I actually got to spend time not covering vaccines and this, and got to cover this decision. So it was a pretty big, uh, big deal for me as well. Um, I think one of the main questions people keep asking me since then is, what happens now? Not a single person I spoke to thinks that all of a sudden the debate on carbon pricing is going to end because of this decision. And I'm hoping our expert panelists today will help shed some light on the way forward and what the implications are from last week's ruling. I don't think most of the experts uh, on this panel need much of it, an introduction, but just for the record, the four panelists we'll hear from today are Ken Boss and Cool, the former chief of staff to Premier Christy Clark in British Columbia, and the former senior campaign advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Gerald Butts, 
the former principal secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Premier Dalton McGuinty, Diane Sachs, the former environmental commissioner of Ontario and the deputy leader of the Green Party of Ontario, Brian Topp, former chief of staff to Alberta Premier Rachel Notley, and former deputy chief of staff to Saskatchewan Premier Roy Romano. And joining us as a discussant is Dale Bugin, the Vice President of Research and Analysis for the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. He's also the former Executive Director of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission. All of our panelists are going to make an opening statement and then we'll have some time for questions. If you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're expecting more than 900 people in the audience today. So uh, our team will moderate the question and answers and bring the most relevant questions to the panel. If there's someone you really want to direct your question to, please identify them uh, when you see, uh, uh, pose your question. Otherwise, I'll just direct it to who I think should answer. Uh, just so you know, this event is being recorded and it will be made available after today. And so now I'd like to begin our discussion. Ken, I think we'll hear from you first. Can you tell us a little bit more about last week's decision? Uh, thank you very much, Mia, and uh, it's a great privilege for me to be on a panel with uh, two of my closest non-conservative friends uh, and two of the smartest uh, gentlemen in their respective parties. I, I just want to make three broader points uh, to start off with. My first point is policy by judges is bad, and we had an election in 2019. We have another election coming, and I think that issues such as climate change should be subject to a debate. And then we should move on. We settled the GST this way. We settled deficit reduction this way. We settled free trade this way. And we should ultimately settle how we're going to address climate change this way. So I think we should debate and move on and not litigate and move on. Secondly, the ball is now firmly in Jason Kenney and Doug Ford's court. In my view, both Jason Kenney and Doug Ford should do the right political thing. The right political thing is both of them should not allow Justin Trudeau to continue to collect money from their citizens and decide how to redistribute it back to their citizens. Instead, both Jason Kenney and Doug Ford should take this revenue into their own coffers and decide themselves how to spend it. They should also do the economically right thing and the fiscally right thing, which is that climate change and how we address climate change should be done at the provincial level. This was the subject of the first eco-fiscal report. And I think it's the right approach for climate policy. Climate policy should be driven by the provinces and not from the federal government. And now Jason Kenney and Doug Ford have a chance to do that and adapt climate policy and carbon pricing according to their own provincial economies and their own provincial priorities. If Jason Kenney and Doug Ford do this, if they take control of climate policy, if they take control of, the, of, of uh, carbon pricing, before a federal election, this issue will go away for Aaron O'Toole. Aaron O'Toole in the leadership campaign said that he would allow provinces to lead. And if Jason Kenney and Doug Ford lead, this will no longer be an issue in the federal election and we can all move on. My third point is that Stephen Harper was the best prime minister Canada ever had. But he made two mistakes. Number one, Senate reform. Senate reform was a big part of his undoing. Number two, his treatment of the carbon tax. And the carbon tax is a, has become a big part of his successor's undoing. And unless we get carbon tax right as conservatives, it will continue to be our undoing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. We'll uh, turn to Jerry now. Do you uh, want to give us uh, your impressions? Well, um, as is often the case, I have a hard time following my friend Ken Bosenkuhl, but I'd uh, just like to start uh, by saying, echoing his sentiment that it's a real pleasure and an honor to be included in this discussion. Um, all the people on this panel uh, and yourself, Mia, have been steeped in this issue for many, 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 many years, and uh, it's good to be part of the discussion. Um, I will start by immediate, and I'll be similarly brief, I'll make three points. Um, uh, the first one I'll make is that the question is what happens next? And I think I got that question as much as you did after this uh, decision. Now, my, my first reaction to that question is that if a change in climate doesn't change the way people think about climate change, then I doubt a Supreme Court decision will either. 
I think that Ken described how we got here, but it's important to reflect on having a relatively calcified political debate where almost all of the people who, um, I don't want to use politically charged language like climate change denialism, Mia, but who are recalcitrant when it comes to action on climate change have found themselves within one political party. Um, whereas uh, there's a healthy debate, I would argue, on the progressive side of the Canadian political spectrum about the specific approach to take on climate change to, um, to uh, make forward progress. And as Ken, didn't, as Ken noted, uh, the, the current law, which was just upheld by the courts, was designed to have maximum flexibility at the provincial level for precisely that reason. So that whatever political party was in power in whatever province, um, they could design a system that met a minimum fe uh, federal standard, um, but that met the very diverse needs of the economy from one province to another. And in my view, I think the, the great tragedy of the development of the last five years was we started out with a very flexible system that different provincial governments adapted to meet their needs, which fell, ap fell apart um, for largely ideological and political reasons as those governments changed hands. So what does this all mean going forward? You know, I often say that uh, climate change is treated like a political issue like any other political issue, but it's not really. It's an issue of physics and chemistry. It's about the immediately apprehended environment around us changing and understandably voters looking, for, looking to political leaders to respond to those changes in a way that creates a secure future for themselves, their families, their community, and the economy. And I think that if you believe that to be the case, if you accept the science, then this issue will get nothing but more difficult over the immediate and midterm future. Because the most important thing to understand about greenhouse gas emissions is that they persist. So we are living with a situation that was caused years ago, and we are currently causing a situation that um, uh, people will be living with for years to come. So when you think about it at the macro level, uh, the politics of climate change will get more and more difficult for the recalcitrant because its impact and reality will be more and more obvious to citizens and voters. And for those who want to stake out leadership positions in both managing the, and mitigating the downside impacts of climate change, which are many as we all know, um, and those who would respond with increasingly innovative policy tools, it's gonna get more competitive. And I think that that's gonna happen, that's a good thing. And I think it's gonna happen both between or among and within the parties. The last point I'll make is uh, I'll, um, I'll similarly boost the two political leaders that I've had a chance to serve in my life uh, and end with the point that leadership really matters on this issue. This is not an issue where the politics are straightforward. It's not one where you're always gonna win votes. It's one where you're often gonna to have to tell your supporters things that they don't wanna hear. And unless the leader that you're supporting um, uh, sees this as one of the two or three reasons she or he gets out of bed in the morning, then they're not gonna make much progress on it. Thanks, Jerry. And Diane, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the decision and, and where do we go from here? You, uh, you need to unmute, Diane. Sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, to me, the climate crisis is like a wildfire and the embers are on our house, they're already sizzling. What I see is that the, the Liberal and NDP policies are like bringing a garden hose to the house. Well, it's better than throwing gasoline on the house, which a lot of the conservatives have been doing, but it sure won't keep the house from burning down. So to me, what the liberals have done is they've used this smokescreen of constitutional doubt as an excuse for doing not very much. We, um, now that the court has ripped away the fig leaf, it's gonna be really clear, I think, to people that the federal government could be doing a lot more. They're just 
choosing not to. And it's the same point that Seth Klein made in his book, The, the Good War. In the Second World War, as I think you know, Seth made very clear, almost every aspect of public and private life was devoted to winning the war. And if we were taking the climate crisis seriously, then our emissions would really be going down. And instead, as I hope all of you know, can, we Canadians have the highest per capita climate change emissions in the, in the G7. Um, and we have a very weak target at Paris and we're not on track for meeting that target at all. So we would know if our leaders were taking the crisis seriously, if they went past, okay, we have a fairly small carbon price, great, but that's not nearly enough to deal with the problem. It clearly isn't enough to bring our emissions down. We would know that they were treating it seriously if we were living in a world where we had a strong climate law that actually put us on track where nature and children had more rights than corporations, um, we would be actively disrupting things that lock us into more fossil fuel dependence. We wouldn't be building more pipelines like TMX that is almost certain to lose a whole batch of money. We wouldn't be building new oil science mines. We wouldn't be building new suburbs or anything else that digs a deeper trap for our kids to try to get out of. Because the climate crisis, I mean, I agree with Jerry, it's here, but it's coming much faster and harder than most people realize. We'd be bending every effort to build a green circular economy and send sending more billions of dollars to the oil patch as the, the Liberals did this year, uh, last year. We'd be using Canadian human financial and uh, natural resources to build the technology and the equipment that the green economy needs. We'd be supporting regenerative agriculture. We'd be eating better food as a result. We'd have millions of good jobs retrofitting businesses. Uh, urban streets would be quiet and green and safe with clean air and lots of people and silent buses. I mean, we would see real changes in our lives, which we do not see. We would protect nature as if our lives depended on it, which it does. Um, and we'd see a steady decline in the inequality that the mainstream parties have allowed to explode in the last 40 years. And if we lived in that world, we'd be able to look our kids in the face and our grandchildren and say, okay, you've got a fair chance at a decent life in a world with a stable climate. But that's not the world we live in. So instead, really, the honest answer to our kids is we're using it all up. There isn't gonna be much least left for you. And it's so late in the game that winning slowly is the same as losing. And to me, the mainstream parties just keep going along as if the scientists can be ignored without consequences, as if we have so much time that just tinkering at the edges like this carbon price was going to be enough. And it is so we really do have this question of leadership. I agree with Jerry that leadership matters enormously. The Second World War showed it, the pandemic has showed it, that people do respond well to strong, honest leadership in a genuine crisis. We are in a genuine climate crisis. And to me, I don't think we're getting strong or honest leadership from, from any of the mainstream parties. What their policies really mean is we know we're in trouble. We're doing as much as we can. And anyway, we're going to be out of office by the time it gets really bad. So that's what the, why Canadians need the Green Party. I mean, I think I'm the only working politician on this panel. We tell the truth so the other parties don't. Um, we show how a green lens can in, uh, illuminate better answers for a whole range of public policies from mental health to housing to the cost of living. And if we do well, the other parties steal our ideas. Well, that's okay. Because the main thing we're here for is to make the truth mainstream so that we actually do what we need to, to sustain our possibility of a world. Because if we don't, we're gonna fall off the cliff. Thanks, Diane. And uh, finally, amongst our panelists, I'll turn to Brian for uh, his impressions of the ruling and where we go from here. I remember the mute button. Um, let me begin by saying um, what a, it is indeed a pleasure to be here. Um, Gerald, I think you have an awful lot to be proud of and how this has worked out in front of the court. And Ken, you have uh, you were a brave voice inside your party. It's a pleasure to, to see you uh, taking a run at it. And Diane, um, welcome to electoral politics. As you just saw, um, it's always exciting to try to frame these things in light of other uh, parties and I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, so look, uh, what I could do with, you know, our topic is talk about the politics of the Supreme Court judgment and I could limit my remarks to the following. Woohoo, we won, yeah! Um, 
And it feels pretty good. You know, victory is rare in politics and we should savor it. But um, I got another four minutes or so to fill. So I will offer three quick remarks. Um, so my first comment is on the politics of this decision is that it should be followed by a period of accountability. And uh, if I can talk from uh, my perspective of 10 years or so in Western provincial government, it is worth remembering that Peter Lougheed and Alan Blakeney worked together very hard uh, in the early 80s to reinforce um, provincial control and ownership of natural resources it was enshrined as part of the charter deal. And what I consider to be their unworthy successors in both Alberta and Saskatchewan um, in the really quite remarkable acts of poor judgment and immaturity contrived to get a number of those issues back in front of the courts in a reference case that they initiated on the basis of some of the worst possible facts trying to persuade the top court of the land uh, to go along with a climate denial agenda because let's be clear that's what this was all about and in consequence they've engineered you know, one of the largest dilutions of provincial control and ownership of natural resources in 40 years. And that is an example of uh, immaturity and poor judgment of a lack of fitness for office. Uh, on one of the core responsibilities of any prairie premier, um, and they merit accountability for that. And I, I think, you know, the people who yell the loudest about this, these kind of issues tend to be in their parties, and so they're going to try to slough it all up, uh, but I don't think they're going to. The second uh, thing that I think is that um, the federal government, you know, reached for an important role here and um, is now going to live uh, the pleasures of victory, which is you wanted it and now you got it. Um, and in particular, the, uh, you know, the national responsibility to see to it that the country is meeting these minimum standards that, to be clear, are very necessary and, uh, uh, and, and appropriate. Um, and that is going to be a tough job, a very tough job, as we've seen uh, in both in the short term and in the long term. And what I mean by that is in the short term, you know, the immediate responses by some of the immature players who engineered this defeat for Western Canada, um, uh, you know, the first thing they had to say was, OK, well, this is the way it's going to be, so now we're going to game it. Right. They were playing around in Saskatchewan about, well, we'll have a carbon price at the pump and then you can get your rebate while you're paying it. So these these are games, attempts at gaming this. And it's going to take some uh, some fortitude in the part of the national government to deal with gaming. And then, you know, a new set of landmines has been strewn in federal provincial relations that will keep us all busy at federal provincial meetings for a long time to come. And one of the interesting ones is the the difference between the two basic models that the federal government is going to be watching here, carbon pricing, that is fairly clear, and cap and trade programs, including provincial only cap and trade programs that are highly ambiguous, I would argue more gameable, and hard to quantify in terms of their effect. And so how, how do you actually police and enforce um, uh, a national framework uh, with such divergent systems, particularly when you when you introduce what's heading toward a $200 a ton carbon price mandated and do, do cap and trade programs really qualify for that? And if they don't, then how do you judge that? And so the federal government has taken on a big job here. And I'll say that, you know, it's not dissimilar to um, the task the federal government gave itself with the Canada Health Act to, to enforce minimum standards in healthcare. And uh, history shows that the federal government uh, goes through cycles on its appetite to enforce that act and um, it arguably is going to be facing more difficult issues than this one. So that's the second political effect. The third and final thing I'd like to talk about is, I, I, I will say, you know, that it's true that the, the, the threat of climate change denialism has focused itself on one party in our political system. And, you know, speaking as a, also as a partisan, um, I, I, I don't mind that Ken's party so far hasn't been listening to him and that they resemble to more and more Canadians, the kind of the party of angry old uncles, you know, who yell about this stuff at the dinner table. But I'm worried about the salience of populist arguments from that neck of the woods aimed at working class voters. And working class voters have, you know, had a tough run for the last 30 years. So the offshoring of their jobs, the demolition of their pension plans, the dismantling of their unions, uh, 
the forcing upon them of terms terms of work at many many workplaces across Canada, in which you know young people coming into the workforce are confronted with much worse conditions, you know deals that are awfully hard to be proud of. Brian, uh, I'm just going to interrupt and, you quickly to ask you to wrap up for uh, quite. And here uh, a perceived threat to the one hope they have, the potential to be employed in uh, in resource development. And so we're, they need to bring them along in what we're doing here, or this climate denial environment is not going to be confined to angry old uncles. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn to Dale, uh, who is a discussant in, in, our, in our conversation and see what he uh, he has to say about what uh, he thinks of the decision. Yeah, thanks, Mia. And it's a pleasure to play mop up for this crew. Lots of great comments here. I mean, interesting, the conversation that the panelists have, have framed here for us. Ken's talking about who, who's going to take the next step, who's going to pick up the baton. Jerry's talking about why there's kind of continued pressure to continue with policy, whether it's political pressure or whether it's pressure from the changing climate and how those two things connect. Diane's asking how much, how much policy, what else in addition to carbon pricing uh, and how all that adds up. And Brian's asking us, well, how? How do we follow through on these commitments given the kind of remaining detailed policy questions? And I'll go pick that up in a second. But also alluding to the fact that this question of whether or not we want policy at all isn't quite done and maybe isn't quite fully litigated in that political arena that Ken has raised. So that's, let me suggest that that kind of sets the frame for where we want to take this. The only thing I will add to that conversation as a policy wonk rather than a politico is this idea that for the first time we actually have policy proposed in Canada that's consistent with our ambition. There isn't this gaping hole between what we want to achieve in our terms of our emissions reductions and the kinds of policies we're putting forward to deliver on it. That's only true though, if we start to really look past just this question of instrument, just carbon pricing, good, other things also good, maybe depending on who you are and how much you live in Ken's camp. We have to get into the details of exactly how we do that. The devils in those details matter. And as we start to look at the provinces and territories implementing their own policies, taking up Ken's call to implement carbon pricing on their own terms, not all of those systems are going to be equally effective. Not all of them are going to be equally strong in delivering emissions reductions. And not all of them are necessarily up to the task in delivering on that 2030 target and beyond the 2050 net zero target. And if we're going to want to really follow through on that gap between ambition and effort, then we're going to need to look at those details. We need to weigh in some of those details about how revenue is being used. Is revenue being used to address equity issues or is it being used to undermine price incentives by, by giving that money right back uh, according to how much fuel is being purchased or to offset other taxes on fuels sending the wrong signal. Those questions matter a little bit at $30 per ton. They matter a lot at $170 per ton. And I think we can't afford not to keep those issues pretty squarely in front of our, our focus. The, the same is true for the industrial systems, the output-based pricing systems. Not all of those systems are entirely symmetric either. And that raises interesting questions for the extent to which they're gonna really drive emissions reductions in the long term, but also to the extent to which they'll drive different signals in different provinces. And that asymmetric force of incentive from province to province and territory to territory is, is another problem we need to think about as we scale up the ambition of these policies from the sort of test cases that we have right now towards the deeper, more ambitious, more stringent and more effective policies that are needed to get to where Diane is edging us towards. Uh, so those are questions for us to think about uh, and the intersection between politics and policy. Thank you. Great, thanks Dale. So not surprisingly, since my job is to ask questions, I have about a million of them for all of you, but I will try to keep it, a sh keep it, keep it down so I can let uh, the, the, the audience ask a few questions as well. I think my first question might be best directed at Ken, but anyone feel free to jump in. 
Why did climate change and carbon pricing in particular become such a partisan issue in this country? What, what started, and we know that Stephen Harper was behind cap and trade in the, the early days of, of his prime ministership. What changed and how did this become such a partisan issue and how do we make it not a partisan issue? Well, people say that it's a, it's a polarized issue between parties, but I would contend that it's a polarizing issue within the Conservative Party and much less polarizing outside of the Conservative Party. And the debate within the Conservative Party is largely between, and Brian touched on this, is largely between the populists and the Conservatives. Uh, you increasingly have a large Conservative camp. I point to British Columbia, where the BC Liberals are the most Conservative Party believe in carbon pricing. The Ontario PC party in December 2018 put out a platform believed in carbon pricing. The Quebec party, most on the right of center of spectrum, uh, believes in carbon pricing. So it, it's, not like, it's not like there's not a debate within the Conservative Party about carbon pricing. And I think that those of us who are ideologically conservative and believe that we ought to have an approach to an issue that is market-based and not government-based, when you have a party that for purely populist reasons has started to say, we want, a, we want a solution to a problem that means bigger government, more regulations, as opposed to letting the market decide, that's not consistent. And so I think ultimately the conservatives have to win this argument and the populists, as they should, should lose the argument. Go ahead, Brian. In a spirit of full confession, let's just remember this. The first and original campaign against carbon pricing was led by the NDP in British Columbia in the Anox the Tax campaign that uh, fractured their coalition um, and therefore was quickly recanted. And the lesson is um, conservatives are not alone in giving into the populist temptation. And all, all brave public policies will be tested in subsequent elections um, to see if, the, if, if office is available by attacking them. Um, and it's a, a you know, tribute to the seriousness of the issue um, that has resisted these populist attacks. I could just add to that, Mia. I, I wouldn't characterize the viewpoint within the Liberal Party of Canada as uniform on this as well. I think coming out of 2008, there were a lot of people who, in my view, very mistakenly misdiagnosed uh, the problem with the party being the green shift platform that uh, Monsieur Dion ran on. Uh, I think that was a mistake, but it created skittishness in a lot of quarters in the party about running hard on climate change. Those were ultimately overcome by the facts on the ground, as I talked about in my opening remarks, and by, importantly, the change in leadership, uh, which uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was very insistent that this was going to be one of the two or three things by which he expected to be judged, and I think he's accepting of that. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I'm also, I think, uh, Ken, I guess we actually saw that debate have to play out in real time uh, at the convention convention uh, a couple weekends ago. Uh, so definitely uh, the debate is strong within parties, uh, there's no doubt. Um, but I'm also curious when you talk to, and this again can go to anyone, whoever wants to jump in first, you talk to average Canadians, most Canadians seem to want to help in some way. They, most Canadians understand that this is a, that this is an issue. But sometimes the goal seems so far away and so hard that they almost want to give up before they start. And the impact on their daily life seems to be so much that they're sort of overwhelmed by it. What, how can you tell Canadians or sort of carry Canadians along with us to go where you all say we need to go when they're almost in many ways overwhelmed and, and afraid of where, where we have to go? Just quickly, Lisa Raitt was on a panel with me uh, last week and she said, I lost my seat in the last election because of climate change. And I've written a number of pieces on polling and just to quickly summarize, in the 905, if the Conservatives don't have a credible climate change policy, which I believe should include carbon pricing, they will lose those seats. And I've also done some work on some polling in Western Canada and Conservative held seats that says the risk to those seats is very low. And in fact, carbon pricing could help win marginal seats in Western Canada. So I think Canadians are moved past what you've just said, Mia. I think, and Conservatives are gonna have to reckon with that. They either have a credible Conservative policy and have a chance of winning, or they don't, and they will lose. Mia, I think that there are lots of ways to make climate change relevant to people and concrete in terms of their daily lives 
Uh, and one of the ways is to think about what makes current life more pleasant. Um, and greening is a really obvious area. We know that people's mental health is better if they have access to um, areas where there's nature. We know that those areas are cooler, better able to withstand storms. And so we can do a lot by creating on ramps where people can see visible change. Um, the United Kingdom Committee on Climate Change has done some great research showing which kinds of initiatives are most <laughs> successful in moving along. And they generally have some combination of reducing carbon emissions, increasing resilience, and creating green areas that people can go to, or some similar concrete benefit that people can see. We've seen this tremendous response to the ability to, to bike safely, to have safe areas to walk on the roads. Um, people didn't need a lot of practice to say, yeah, this is really good. We like this better. Um, giving people more of that is a way to build that on-ramp. Also creating jobs in the retrofitting where you make the home more comfortable, cheaper to live in and um, create great jobs that are, that are local. So lots of things we can do. Thank you. So I do have a ton more questions, but the questions from our audience are also uh, piling up and I generally can ask you guys questions most of the time anyway. So I will turn to them uh, and we will start with, sorry, I'm just uh, scrolling up here all the way back to the top. Um, when are the, this is a question from Bernie, when are the premiers going to outline their policies and how challenging is it for Aaron O'Toole to have a climate change policy that addresses climate change following what happened at that convention a couple of weeks ago? I guess, Ken, uh, this one's also for you. Yeah, I, I mean, I addressed, I addressed the Kenny and Ford challenge in my opening remarks and, you know, I, I, I can't believe, given the fiscal challenges both of those governments are facing, that they're going to continue to allow money to flow into the federal government as opposed to taking control of those revenues themselves. It would just be the height of folly to do so. And so I, I, I hope and expect that'll happen. The challenge from Aaron O'Toole's perspective is how quickly that happens. There's some talk of an election in the next few months, and that may not be enough time for these governments to announce their intentions with respect to where they go with this policy. Uh, we've already heard Scott Moe has said he's going to bring a, dom a domestic, if you will, <laughs> provincial carbon pricing plan. And, you know, we can argue about whether he's done the right things, but, but I think it's a huge move in the right direction that he's going to do that. And I'm hoping and urging Ontario and Alberta to do the same. And hopefully we won't have an election until the fall and that'll be sorted out. And, and then Aaron O'Toole won't have this as a big albatross around his neck the way it is potentially is now. Yeah, if I okay. could jump in on that one, Mia, I, yep. I alluded to this in my opening remarks, but I think it's actually a real opportunity for Aaron O'Toole, right? That Aaron O'Toole can prove to, uh, sooner or later, leaders have to, as I said, leaders have to tell their supporters what they think they need to hear, not just what they want to hear. Otherwise, they're just followers. And if O'Toole, if Mr. O'Toole can stand up to uh, the people in his party who are way offside where most Canadians think we need to go, there's an opportunity there for a leadership moment with him. At the end of the day, as I understand things with uh, the Conservative Party, the platform has to be um, signed off on by the leader. It's the document on which she or he stands up and presents uh, um, what a Conservative government would look like. And there, and Mr. O'Toole is that person. He's got the responsibility and the opportunity to say, whatever was said at our convention, this is what I'll do. Perfect. And Jerry, I'm gonna direct the next question to you as well. Um, a question from Peter, who wants to know about advocacy for the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the decision uh, to go after the Trans Mountain Pipeline and build it, and how that fits with bringing a price on carbon. Whoa, uh, how long do I have to answer this question? <laughs> maybe, maybe we can take it offline and have an email exchange about it. Look, I think this has been um, written about extensively and I think rather accurately that there was a feeling both in the government uh, and uh, well, in the federal government and I think in the Alberta government at the time, Brian here backed me up, that um, in order for uh, in order for us to achieve a nationally sustainable uh, climate plan, um, the industries that were very important to Western Canada, in particular to Alberta and Saskatchewan, had to see a future for themselves within it. And the uncertainty about um, 
uh, the obstacles that that particular project faced, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, became so uh, um, extreme that only a, uh, a robust response by the federal government uh, could overcome those obstacles, that the project was going to die if it were left in private hands. And most importantly, it was considered a project in the national interest, not because of the impact it would have on the overall carbon footprint of the country, but that it would open up um, markets other than the United States for our resources. And that part got lost in the debate as much as we tried to focus uh, people's attention on it. It really wasn't about carbon abatement or the acceleration or the increase of the country's carbon emissions. It was about the fact that the country that we'd sold almost all of our oil to for the entirety of our production of it had suddenly become the world's biggest producer of oil and needed less of it. So we needed to find other markets for it if we were to continue uh, to have a stable um, industry. And that's what the TMX pipeline was really all about. Brian, I think I saw your hand uh, go up there. So just a little bit more about this. Um, if you're going to adopt climate change leadership policies in Alberta and then nationally that are that are pointing to decarbonization fairly quickly in the in the scale of industry, then you're gonna to have to confront the reality that a big chunk of our country is resource and in particular energy driven. Uh, and because of some very regrettable decisions made uh, in, in its recent history, um, haven't accumulated the capital that they need to finance uh, a transition to something else. And so there's a relatively small amount of time to do something about that. And so what this is trying to address is when we set on the course to decarbonization in Western Canada, which is heavily energy export develop, uh, uh, dependent, needs to accumulate capital to transition to something else. And it's, and it's really challenged to do that in the present market environment because of what Jerry just said, that a the sole market is now our principal competitor and by the way, feels free to discount uh, petroleum exports by 20 to 40%. And so what that project was attempting to do was to create an, uh, another buyer uh, to try to deal with this matter, to try to increase the value of the exports for as long as they're gonna continue as high as possible to get the maximum amount of value from a declining export uh, into Western Canada to create an opportunity to accumulate capital to do something else. That was, that was how, uh, how it fits into the climate change leadership plan. And, you know, I, I, we're back to what I was saying uh, earlier, which is this, this policy direction will fail if you don't bring resource workers along with you. And, you know, people in Western Canada look to the energy industry as in, 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 a, in a circumstance of 30 years of austerity, as one of the few pieces of hope for them and their families. Uh, and if what you're gonna do is say it's on the road to being phased out, then you're gonna need to provide another uh, hope, a credible hope, which includes pointing to a bridge between now and where you want to get to. And this was a piece of that. Stuart, did I see that you wanted to, to weigh in on that? And you have to unmute yourself. Am I unmuted? Here we go. You're, yeah. a, a lot of my environmental friends will hate me saying this, but um, regardless of what you think about the Trans Mountain Pipeline, it's taken up way too much of the oxygen in the climate change debate in Canada. Um, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones and the age of fossil fuels will not end but we, I mean, because we run out of oil and gas. We have way more oil and gas available than we can burn to stay within a two degree climate. Uh, and so if you wanna, if Canada wants to be a leader in decarbonizing our economy, the most effective thing we can do is to change to products that don't use oil and gas to electric vehicles, well-insulated buildings, next generation industry. If we drive down demand for the product, it will have vastly more impact than trying to restrict the supply of oil and gas from Alberta. And plus we'll avoid the hypocrisy of using lots of oil and gas that we buy from elsewhere. So I'm an ardent climate change advocate, but I'd like to see 90% of the energy going into driving down demand for fossil fuels as opposed to trying to restrict the supply of it, which will have relatively little effect on climate change. Everyone wants to weigh in here. So go ahead, Ken. 
just quickly, the Canada LNG project is probably the biggest uh, energy project in Canada in many years, if not ever. It was done in a in the in British Columbia under an NDP government with a federal Liberal government, and it will supply liquid natural gas to help in the transition from where we are today to where we're going. Canada would be irresponsible not to supply the world with its very clean natural gas as the world moves through this transition. It would be irresponsible, as Brian says, to Western workers, and it would be irresponsible to our country not to do it. So we should be embarking on energy projects that help the world get from where we are to where we're going. Perfect. And Diane, any, uh, do you have anything you want to say on that, on that topic in particular? Well, I mean, the main thing for me was that you know, TMX was supposed to make money, right? There's been lots of arguments that it was going to make money that the government was going to use to fund the green transition and um, maybe help pay for Indigenous reconciliation as well. But according to the Parliamentary Budget Office, it's only going to make money if neither Canada nor the United States take strong climate policy. And that's not true. It's not what's going to happen. So judging from that analysis this thing is not only a hole in the money a hole in the ground that could take out a huge amount of money to build is then we'll lose money steadily thereafter so that doesn't sound to me like a good idea perfect so there are a number of questions coming up about the idea of a border carbon adjustment so i'm going to throw it out there and i guess i think i saw dale put his hand up maybe wants to tackle that one but um, we've heard talk of it, but it seems like a new idea. And if anyone wants to shed some light on where Canada should go on that and what impact it could have, for example, if the US does it, um, that would be uh, great. Yeah, this is a tricky one. So the idea here is that you're putting price on carbon embedded in imports and trying to level the playing field internationally. So a few piece number one, this is only possible under trade rules if there's kind of a consistent carbon price across Canada. And I think that there are still outstanding questions about exactly how those provincial territorial systems all reflect that true price of carbon and establish that minimum level. Number two, there's a question about whether it's desirable for Canada to do this, uh, especially if the US doesn't go along for the ride. And that's because we depend so much on trade that there are legitimate questions about whether we wanna be making imports more expensive and what that means for how well we do as a country. The third piece then is whether the US goes along for the ride. And I am not sure that they can without putting a price on carbon themselves. And that doesn't seem to be where the Biden administration is going. They're going hard on climate, but through instruments other than carbon pricing rather than carbon pricing. So those are more questions than answers, but I don't see a straight shot yet to borrow carbon adjustments for Canada. I'm happy to add to that, Mia. I, this is a topic we follow uh, very closely at Eurasia Group. And I think that the border carbon adjustment needs to be seen in the context of uh, geopolitics, that what it's really about is um, block competition for the consequential parts of the supply chains that will make up clean energy industry from electric vehicle production, solar and wind, uh, battery storage, all of the tech hydrogen, all of the technologies that are seen to be uh, the winning technologies of the future. And the Europeans, which is where this, this, where this discussion is most live and most ripe, um, are not keen to repeat the experience of the last 15 years where they developed a bunch of policy me mechanisms to have solar and wind power grow in their domestic markets only to see the Chinese take over those supply chains and then export the technology back to Europe. So what does that all mean for Canada? Once again, because we've been fighting with ourselves for too long on this topic, we're gonna end up being policy takers probably and not policy makers. And the Europeans have a big decision to make in the transatlantic relationship with the Biden administration of how they construct this um, border carbon adjustment so that it filters out heavy emitting uh, primary industries from Asia while allowing finished products, which is mostly what they import from the United States into their marketplace. This is a very, very big thing. And it's if you've never heard of it, now's the time to educate yourself about it if you're interested in climate change, because it is uh, the camel's nose under the tent of uh, the use of non-tariff barriers to achieve carbon abatement ends. Interesting. Diane, I think you want to you want to say something? Yeah, just so there's also an important role in labeling. So we have, for example, very clean um, steel producers in some places who can produce comparatively low carbon steel. 
but it, they don't get a premium for that on the world market right now. And there's no recognized system of labeling that allows them to claim such a premium. As the, the task force um, TCFD disclosure pushes through and we get more demands for disclosure also of embodied carbon and materials, a proper labeling system could be really helpful to some Canadian producers. It's something um, we don't work hard enough for internationally. Perfect. So a question now from Rob, how does the court win for the carbon tax impact the federal government's ability to legislate on things like electricity? Could this indicate something like a national clean electricity or energy standard is something we could look for? Uh, Diane, since you're unmuted, you want to start? Um, well, of course, the court is very clear in their decision that their decision is restricted to pricing. So they said, yes, climate change is a uh, an urgent threat. They do also quote from the Vancouver Declaration and the study that followed it that the three critical steps of uh, carbon pricing is one, strong relations is a third, investment in, um, in solutions is, is, is the exact. Carbon pricing, strong regulations, investment solutions are all critical parts of this. I think the federal government would have to, might have to use its criminal law power if they wanted to uh, go more broadly into regulations. I suspect we are going to see that fight happen uh, unless the provinces get together and decide to have a conversation instead of having a battle on this, which would of course send uh, much better to spend money on solving problems than on spending money on lawyers, I'm sorry. Brian? I think the federal government has a different role in the electricity market. And that is that um, it can be the honest broker that gets what is currently an archipelago of, of fragmented provincial systems that are all looking to make money by exporting power to the United States. Some of them having big surpluses and some of them still burning burning dirt for, to generate their electricity and get them to work together. And the federal, federal role here is basically uh, it, uh, tucked up in its spending power. This is about you know, getting people to act in the national interest, even if there's a few more bucks to be made exporting in the South. It's about, uh, tr you know, trying to take practical steps toward a national electricity grid. It is helping people deal with the economics of phasing out carbon-based power uh, generation and getting into renewables. Um, and it's about getting people to trust each other, um, which, is, uh, which is in short supply. Um, and provinces are loath to trust other provinces with their electricity supply. I've been covering the idea of a national energy grid my entire career, so it'll be really interesting to see if- You must be from Manitoba. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll turn to Ken for this question. Uh, it's a question from Blair. Uh, what is the opinion of the panelists on what the private sector petroleum industry reaction was to this ruling and where they think policy should go? And I will add to that, of course, the American Petroleum Institute last week endorsed the idea of carbon pricing. Have we seen anything like that or can we expect something like that here? Uh, I'm a fifth generation Albertan, and I know from that experience that saying that the, the energy industry has a common view on anything is probably the dumbest thing you could possibly say. And so there is no consensus view in the industry. But what I will say is the largest Canadian players and the largest global players clearly are designing their investments around a carbon price. What I will also say is global and, and Jerry probably knows more about this than I do working at a Eurasia group, but global capital and the, the uh, requirements of global capital to invest in clean economies and economies that take climate change seriously is what is ultimately, one of the things that's ultimately gonna drive this debate. Um, people sometimes bemoan the power of global capital, but in this case, global capital is demanding that people take climate change seriously. And the energy industry relies on global capital. Most of our energy, well, a lot of our energy industry is owned, uh, is owned by Americans and other people. And they understand that global capital requires a uh, legitimate climate policy. Uh, David Legg is uh, running a group in Alberta for Premier Kenny on Invest Alberta. And he made this very clear in a recent interview he did. And I'm very glad to see the Alberta government understands the importance of ESG policy for investment into Alberta. Brian, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, oh, I think, Jerry, okay. sorry, I think Ken is absolutely right on the capital formation front that global capital pools are um, moving into renewable sources of energy by preference and revealed preference. This isn't just what they're saying in their annual reports. This is where they're actually allocating their capital 
and we advise a lot of those uh, firms all over the world. I think the key um, thing to keep in mind when we're talking about conventional oil and gas, in particular oil, because oil and gas are different things and we often uh, talk about them like they're the same thing. And in particular in Canada, where we have relatively low carbon gas and very high carbon oil, they are really different things. So um, we believe anyway at Eurasia Group that the, there is a future for uh, oil and gas that is low carbon, relatively low cost, and low risk. And we have one of those things checked off despite our best efforts, and that is low political risk in Canada, um, despite our best domestic efforts to eradicate that, com that comparative advantage. We've got a lot of work to do on the low carbon front. Uh, and. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do on the low cost front. So a constructive dialogue around the future of the conventional energy industry would be focused on those things. Great. So there are, as usual, way too many questions for us to get to, but uh, we'll have to wait for another time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Stuart to, to uh, close things off here. Thank you. Um, well, that's a tough act to follow. Um, what a great group of panelists and thank you for a, a candid discussion. You know, you, you look around the world, um, countries like uh, UK and Germany, and you realize that many countries don't have this left-right polarization over carbon pricing and climate policy that we've had in Canada for the last decade. And as some people pointed out, even some provinces in Canada don't have that polarization. I think the big thing is the last point we just heard about the capital needed to drive a prosperous low carbon economy. What capital hates is policy instability. Uh, what will drive capital for the hills is a sense that every time we have an election, climate policies are gonna get ripped up. So we've got to get to a place of stable, predictable long-term climate policy in this country, not just for environmental reasons, but if we wanna actually get our fair share of the prosperity in a low carbon future. Uh, let's hope that the parties can find a way to come together in the Supreme Court has uh, paved the way for pricing as a way of supporting national action. But as people pointed out, there's gonna have to be continued policy on things like vehicles, buildings, industry, uh, and we're gonna need to have this same federal provincial ambition that's across both regional and partisan lines. Um, hopefully the, the spirit that we heard from the people today will um, infuse our party leaders. Uh, Canadian politicians have a history of coming together on tough issues. You think about healthcare, free trade, where we've had big dust ups, but late finally come together for the good of the country uh, across partisan lines. Let's hope this is the beginning of that same kind of change in Canada, um, where we show leadership on the biggest challenge of our time. Thank you all very much for all you've done on this issue and for taking the time to speak with us today.